It's May 4th, 1896, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. There were not one, but two strap lines on the first ever edition of the London Daily Mail, published on this day in 1896. The first said, a penny newspaper for one half penny. The other, the busy man's daily journal. So I feel like right from the beginning, the Mail had nailed its target consumer. In those days, basically, cost-conscious middle management who wanted a simpler, shorter more readable paper. There were already other half penny papers, but they were pretty cheap in every sense of the word. And there were also penny papers as well, but they were kind of on the wordy and for some people dull end of the spectrum. So I suppose the idea with the Daily Mail was that it delivered quality at a budget price. Well, I mean, I think the key statistic is that there was this huge underserved market of newly literate working class people. So between 1851 and 1900, literacy rates have gone from 69% to 97% for men and from 55 to 97% for women. So there was this huge audience of people who wanted to stay abreast of the news, but they needed it to be in an affordable and easily digestible format. You know, people who would have been working full time might have felt put off by the elitist tones of the existing newspapers, which, you know, like a lot of media today, the highbrow papers tend to assume a lot of shared background and cultural knowledge that not all audiences might share. So the Harmsworth brothers who founded the Daily Mail, Alfred, later Viscount Northcliffe, and Harold, later Viscount Rothermere, they'd already established themselves as publishers of cheap periodicals aimed at working class readers. So they knew this target market was there. Yeah, and Alfred actually addressed the bargainous nature of the publishing price in his opening editorial. He said... Our type is set by machinery, and we can produce many thousands of papers per hour, cut, folded, and, if necessary, with the pages pasted together. It is the use of these new inventions on a scale unprecedented in any English newspaper office that enables the Daily Mail to effect a saving of from 30 to 50% and be sold for half the price of its contemporaries. That is the whole explanation of what would otherwise appear a mystery. (laughs) 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 Which, in a way, was quite generous of him, really, to his rivals, wasn't it? Now don't copy me and found the Daily Express, you might have. Added as a postscript. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the other genius thing about it was that it had a whole lot of different types of information. It had uh, information on fashion for women. This woman lives in a ten thousand pound Belgravia townhouse, and you won't believe what's up her petticoat. <laughs> yeah, that kind of thing. Exactly. <laughs> I presume it had some salacious bits, and then it had fashion bits, and it had sports news, and then it had cookery, and that was really unusual for its time. Yeah, I mean, they took inspiration from the U.S. newspapers, particularly Joseph. Pulitzer's New York World. So they had scandal, as you might expect, but also sentiment and human interest. And these weren't things that really featured in British newspapers at the time. You'd have found them in periodicals and magazines, particularly those aimed at a female audience. But the Daily Mail really brought them all together. They realised that if you're reading about a war on the front page, by the time you got to page four or five, you might be interested in a, a nice story about someone doing something charitable or just something a bit funny, you know, from the lighter side of life and just mixing them all in one big bowl. But to be fair, not everyone was a fan of this approach, including the then Prime Minister Lord Salisbury, who called it a newspaper produced by office boys for office boys. Ouch. But it was a huge success. The planned first issue was meant to run to 100,000 copies, but instead the print run on the first day was 397,000 copies. And additional printing facilities had to then be acquired to sustain a circulation which rose to 500,000 in 1899. It became the first national newspaper to print in the north. They had bought a print works in Manchester, as well as in London, because previously what was done was everything was printed in Mm. London and then train loads of newspapers were sent up north. So obviously readers outside of London and were getting their newspapers later than everyone else. And they also looked towards the international market much earlier than some of their rivals too. So what they would do, again, you know, the standard procedure was just to ship copies over the channel. But the Daily Mail telegraphed its articles to an office in Paris where they were printed and put on sale. So you'd be having them with your breakfast in your Parisian hotel at the same time as you'd have had them at your home in the UK. Looking at this first issue, though, it is... What it always was, uh, you know, Tory, low-tax, pro-empire, anti-Semitic, anti-immigrant, anti-welfare state. That's all there. But it is rather more austere Mm. and rather more straightforwardly flag-waving patriotic than the kind of muckraking tabloid that we see now. I mean, uh, provocative, I suppose, to an extent, an editorial in there 
uh, says the motor carriage will never displace the smart trotting pony. I think that's uh, <laughs> fair to say an opinion that time has not been kind to. I like that um, one. But what they were trying to do with that piece was that they were advocating for Britain to get serious about producing some motor vehicles of its own, if only to mm. keep pace with France. And that sense of fear of what the rest of Europe was doing as well was quite prescient. I mean, Harmsworth was, right from the beginning, warning about what Germany might do, which eventually led to World War I. By 1914, he controlled 40% of the morning newspapers, 45% of the evening newspapers, and 15% of the Sunday total newspaper circulations in Britain. So he was a kind of Murdoch-type mm. figure. He actually owned the Times as well by this point. Mm. Uh, and as a result of that constant warning about Germany, he was invited into the cabinet as a propagandist. Mm. And that had been a bit of a new direction for the Daily Mail, because in the early years it had taken on this jingoistic, imperialistic tone that was pretty much what the government wanted, especially during the Boer War, which was what really catapulted the Daily Mail into mainstream success. By the end of the war in 1902, it was reaching a million readers a day. And they were gripped mm. by the Mail's frontline dispatches, which were much more exciting than what the other newspapers were offering, which was like these relatively dry reports. And also this sort of thumpy, flag-waving attitude that just wasn't present in the more serious newspapers. But then it sort of backfired in World War One. The Daily Mail came out with these really searing criticisms of the British government including Lord Kitchener, who was a hero to millions of people. And that actually caused readership to drop significantly. Although they were in a difficult position because of criticising the government as a kind of tabloid newspaper, but also wanting to be, as you said, patriotic and tub-thumping, created this context whereby the British public for perhaps the first time, came to learn a crucial lesson about the mass market media, which is what they read in the papers isn't necessarily true. Yeah. I think before then, people just expected that the newspaper men, as they were called, would bring you perhaps a sensationalised but basically true record of events. And during the First World War, men were coming back from the front saying we were being slaughtered out there. Why is it saying on the front that nothing happened? Yeah, I feel like criticisms from the 1920s may be as relevant today as they were back then. There was this comment from Piers Brendan who said, uh, Northcliffe's methods made the Mail the most successful newspaper hitherto seen in the history of journalism. But by confusing G-jaws with pearls, by selecting the paltry at the expense of the significant, by confirming atavistic prejudices and by oversimplifying the complex... Northcliffe titillated if he did not debauch the public mind. He polluted if he did not poison the wells of knowledge. And then his brother backed Hitler. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about that. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, if Northcliffe hadn't been bad enough, he actually died in 1922, which gave Rothermere more editorial sway. He'd gone into it as being the business head, but now he had editorial control as well. He was very, very conservative already. And then also two of his three sons had died in World War One. So t he took the paper from being, as it had been in the Boer War times, this flag-waving publication saying, let's march in and, you know, slaughter all the enemies, to saying, well, maybe we should just hear what Mr. To Hitler has to say. He was championing Mussolini, Mosley in this country, famous editorial hurrah for the black shirts, which now looks like I think an all-time low, mm. even if you are a fan of the Daily Mail, uh, and actually pleading for appeasement with Nazi Germany. Yeah, I mean, Rothermere was a personal friend of Hitler's. You know, he, he went out there and stayed with him. He corresponded with him throughout the 1930s. And Rothermere had appointed his son Esmond as chairman of Associated Newspapers by this time as well. And he was a fascist sympathiser also. So it was kind of a full scale takeover. Although obviously once Britain entered the war, they pretty sharply tried to scale back, but which obviously must have been a bit of a head spinning moment for the readership. One of the weird ongoing things that the paper had, particularly in its early days, was its interest in aviation. Did you guys clock this? That they were offering prizes for people to take certain kinds of uh, flights. So in 19 six the paper offered all immigrants a one-way <laughs> ticket to Africa. Yeah. <laughs> no? <laughs> Not quite, though I'm sure they would have been into that. But, um, but no, in 1906, the paper had this £10,000 prize for the first flight from London to Manchester, followed by a £1,000 prize for the first flight across the English Channel. They were always trying to push forward technology, I presume as a potential benefit to the British Empire itself. They were also the first newspaper to have a women's section, which I think now the idea of having a section for women is something that's sort of on its way out. It's a bit of a legacy feature in most newspapers that still have it. But at the time, the idea that women's interests might be considered worthy of being included in a newspaper that men 
and also might look at, you know, was in yeah. itself quite revolutionary. And it actually ended up giving birth to the Daily Mirror. So the popularity of the women's section in the Mail led the Harmsworths to launch the Daily Mirror in 1903. And it was a, pa- a paper by women for women with an all-female editorial staff. However, um, despite these promising beginnings, the following year they decided to revamp it to be a picture-led paper aimed at a mass market, men and women, and all of the women editorial staff were sacked. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oosh. Tomorrow. I want the smell of fresh laundry as a child from a convent and the thing that reminds me of having sex with multiple partners. Love the show? Support the show. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.